되는 Hi, Adriana. Hello everyone, yet again for an exciting chapter in our journey um, learning about numerical methods. Again, it's a pleasure being here with you. I wish I was lecturing to you in real, uh, in, in person uh, for an even better experience, uh, but we'll have to make, uh, to make due with all of this. Um, today's chapter, we're gonna start on a new uh, chapter in our journey and it's about linear least squares regression, uh, regression analysis. And this is one of the most exciting uh, topics that I have to lecture about. Uh, and I think it's a, it's going to take whatever we learned so far, the little bits and pieces and puts it in a realistic, um, a very useful uh, sense of what uh, numerical methods is going uh, to be and going to help you. And you've probably done uh, regression, some type of regression analysis in Excel or in um, you know some of the other plotting software that you use. But the purpose of this chapter is to explain to you fundamentally what is going on behind the scenes and how to, in, to analyze, uh, do a, regre a proper regression analysis. Okay. The learning objectives for this chapter are numerous, but they are, uh, I think they are, they're going to deliver a lot of value for you. So at the end, um, I, I, I expect you to know the following. So given a set of observations, you'll be able to compute a benefit curve or a model that represents the data and minimizes the error between the model and the observations. So this is, if you think, if you put regression as um, a, a, an interpolation, together they are an umbrella of cur under the umbrella of general curve fitting interpolation made sure that it went through each and every point it just allowed you to um, find well certainly well behaved certain well behaved data um, that is kind of very predictable um, and uh, put it into a fit where you can interpolate between the points. Regression, on the other hand, is still part of curve fitting, but it means something else. And we're gonna understand that, that meaning um, uh, very well, hopefully, in this chapter. You're gonna be able to define what linear regression is. Um, linear regression does not necessarily mean fitting to a straight line. We're gonna fit to a polynomial, to an exponential, and we're still gonna call that linear regression. And we'll, we'll be able to understand why we call it linear regression. You're gonna be able to conduct uh, linear regression for polynomial models and certain nonlinear models, like I just said, you're going to be able to, uh, to define and compute the mean standard deviation and the standard error. Uh, so I'm going to try to challenge your understanding of what the mean is, what the standard deviation is, and we're going to define something new called the standard error, and we're going to define it in a very intuitive and practical manner, uh, unlike what you might see when learning about regression analysis. You'll be able to define and compute the R-squared value, which uh, 
uh, is going to be a measure of how well your curve fit, fits the data. And you'll be able to create code in Python that does regression. We're going to do both. We're going to create our own regression matrix, and we're going to derive the, the fit and plot it and use it to do predictions. But also, we're going to use uh, polyfit, which we learned about in the previous chapter, but we're going to change the degree of the polynomial. And by changing the degree of the polynomial to be less than the number of points, so you go one or two, etc., that's going to return to you a regression, a regression model. And we're going to compare that regression model to the one we derived, and they should be exactly on top of each other. You're going to learn about the normal equations, which is a generalization of the least squares regression derivation. Uh, as you've probably guessed so far, I, I follow an inductive approach um, in our learning. I start small by doing small little observations and building complexity as we, uh, we move along. And uh, normal equations is as complex as linear regression can get, but it's a very powerful generalization. So you'll be able to do regression uh, with the normal equations very easily on crazy models that are not necessarily just polynomial like ax plus b you'll be able like to do a cosine cosine omega t plus p sine omega t for example um, you'll be able to also convert a nonlinear model certain nonlinear models into linear regression analysis and formulate the equations for nonlinear regression so that's going to be the last um, uh, once we hit the last the end of this chapter okay so our chapter begins with a, a story. We're going to uh, do this story together. Um, there uh, was, at one point, a forensic an anthropologist uh, who was called to inspect a certain burial site that was found um, somewhere in the city. And she went there only to discover that there were just a bunch of bones left um, in that burial site, um, including a, a femur. Okay, now, if, if the femur is a very important bone in the human body, it's um, in, 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 your, in your leg over here. And uh, uh, that femur can be used to do a lot of predictions about the structure and the uh, uh, shape, the body, that to, to, to whom that femur belonged. Um, so she was tasked with identifying uh, the height of the individual to whom the femur belonged among other things. So this apparently was a uh, top secret, uh, you know, there was suspicion that uh, this individual is a VIP or a top secret, uh, you know, person. And they, uh, they were shrouded with mystery, but she was tasked essentially with, that's what we know is that she was tasked uh, to uh, predict the height of the individual using that femur. Now, being a very smart and forensic anthropologist, um, she, uh, she looked at the bone, she measured it, uh, that femur was 43 centimeters in length, and then she remembered that um, in her anthropology uh, textbooks and data uh, databases, there is data that measures femur length Okay, femur length with heights of individuals. So, um, you know, the x axis essentially you have femur length, and on the y axis you have uh, the height of the individual. So, she goes ahead and being a, uh, a, a Python uh, person, she plots the data like we always do, get familiar with it. She plots the data that she obtained from her textbook and plots it in Python. Okay, or a Jupyter notebook, let's say. And the data is given to you here in this table. Um, there's the femur height, there's 40, 41, et cetera, and then the femur length, and then the height of the individual. Now note one thing, for example, there's, we start at 40 centimeters. Those are the measurements observed from people who come to clinics, um, from samples we collect from the population. Um, there's two measurements here, 43 centimeter and 43 centimeter for the femur height for the femur length, but two different heights for the individuals. One of them is 167 and one of them is 164. So, you know, for a single data point for the femur length, 43 centimeters, um, there were two heights, 164 and 167. Same thing for 44 centimeters. Um, and that's realistic because that's what happens in life. We all have uh, different variations in our genetics and the environments we grow up in. So, you know, for the same femur length, we might, one person might be taller, one person might be a little bit shorter. So anyway, she gets that data and that's that collective data and she plots it in Python and she sees this, um, these dots that I'm showing here. She then thinks, okay, let me do a, um, 
a, a straight line fit, uh, sorry, a straight line interpolation on this data so that I'm able to get the height of the individual at 43. So clearly there's 167 and 164. She could have taken the average, but is this a good prediction? So then she attempts to do a linear fit. What if, what if she wants to use those data to do a prediction at a different, for a different um, um, femur length, like 43.7, for example? Um, well, when she does the linear interpolation, the data looks like that. It just doesn't make sense, right? There's lines going up and down. Um, there's no general trend in the, in the interpolation. And clearly, that's not a good interpolation. And then she tries polynomial interpolation, and she gets something like this. And the entire polynomial is out of whack because we have uh, multiple data points, double data points with two different y values. So the polynomial uh, fit, the polynomial interpolation really doesn't make sense in that case and clearly doesn't pass through each and every point. Like we learned, a polynomial interpolation needs to pass through each and every point. Now she steps back for a second and thinks, okay, um, you know, looking at this data, clearly interpolation is not a good strategy to predict the height of the individual. Um, but she observes and sees that there is a trend in this data. You cannot see my hand, but I'm doing my hand like this. So there's a sort of a trend along that line, right? So that line doesn't hit each and every point, but can I, it feels like on average, it captures the trend of the data. As the femur length increases, um, the height of the individual also increases and there's a slope, right? But you know, we're going to have variability between the different data points. And so instead of saying, I want to do interpolation to get the point exactly, how about I can do something on that is kind of captures the trend. But now I want to ask you, based on what you know so far about numerical methods, could you fit a straight line into more than two data points. Now remember, we learned that between two points, you just connect the line. Now I'm presenting you with over 10 points, right? Can you draw a straight line between those points based on what you've learned so far in, in numerical methods, okay? So let's switch back now to Zoom and do not forget to mute your, to mute your YouTube, okay? Okay, so we are back on Zoom right now, and I'm going to give you a minute to think about this. Were you able to hear me well? And uh, sorry, I had my microphone muted. We are back on Zoom now. I'll give you a few more seconds or uh, about 30 seconds to think about this. Now, if you glance on YouTube, you're going to see me and the Zoom video and the Wheel of Fortune thing and, uh, and the slide with the question on it. Um, all right. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and spin that wheel. And that wheel is going to show the spin on the YouTube. Okay, let's see. Spinning the wheel now. All right, so we got James, James Walker. James, are you with yes. us? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. So, um, I mean, could we just like take a line and move it until it touches three points? Um, well, well, based on what you know so far, we learned about interpolation essentially. Could you fit a straight line in all of these data? based on what no. we know no yeah exactly that's we cannot now you might start talking about a regression or a data fit that's what we're going to learn about but based on what we know so far there is no way we could um uh, we could uh, fit all of the just 
to our straight line in all of those data, all right? So now we're gonna switch back to the YouTube and uh, try to learn the procedure of fitting a straight line with more than two data points. Don't forget to mute yourselves on Zoom. Thank you. Okay, now we are back um, uh, from the Zoom discussion. So uh, as we discussed there, you, based on what we know so far, there is no way we could just draw a straight line in all of those data because that straight line needs to connect two points uh, together and we have more than two points. Now, our anthropologist is really smart because uh, she clearly has taken numerical methods at the University of Utah. So she knows what to do in this case. And she knows that there's something called regression analysis, which is a much better strategy to approximate um, or to fit or to represent data that is complicated like, like this data. And that's called regression analysis. I'm gonna show you the solution now, what she did, and then we learn how to do it together. And with regression, she essentially can obtain a formula to represent that trend in the data, that straight line that is going up um, in the data. Uh, and that straight line needs to meet certain criteria, like it's gonna minimize, we're gonna learn that it's gonna minimize a certain error. It's gonna have to, to be conditioned on something because we're gonna use that condition to be able to just get those, that straight line with the two unknowns, which are the slope and the intercept to represent all of those data. And she gets that formula, which is 1.0043x plus 123.21. So y in this case represents the femur, the per, excuse me, the person's height, and the x value represents the femur length. And with that formula, she just plugs in 43 centimeters and she gets a height of 166.9 centimeters. Now you see the straight line resulting from what we call the regression, is doesn't touch any of the points actually in this case. It just kind of goes in between them, but it captures the trend, okay? Now, the basic idea of regression is as follows. Given many observations, all right, we are gonna call those the input data, um, we are gonna approximate or represent those input data with a model. So now um, we're not using interpolation where we interpolation, we required it to pass through each and every point. Right now, we don't care about that. We want to model those data. And looking at the input data, in this case, for example, a, a nice, there's a tr linear trend, there's a straight line trend, right? So our model curve is gonna be, in this case, is gonna be a straight line, okay? And clearly the distance between the, those points and the model curve, is gonna be an error. It's gonna be the error that we committed using the model to represent those data. When we were doing interpolation, the interpolant went through each and every point. So there was no error over there, but clearly in between the points, nobody knew how the behavior is gonna be, especially with polynomial interpolants, right? They get um, uh, quite wiggly, uh, quite oscillatory. But in this case, we're gonna fix the straight line or the model curve in between the data Right, but we're committing an error, okay? You agree that this is an error, okay? The idea behind regression is to find the model curve, okay, to find the model curve that minimizes the error, the total error, an aggregate error, a total measure of the error between the input data and the model curve. Okay, so mathematically, we're gonna start doing this with a simple example of a straight line. Okay, and we're gonna assume, you can assume your model curve to be what you want, and you will learn about this as we move on in this chapter. But for now, we're gonna assume our model curve is a straight line, and a straight line is described by, we're gonna call this Y model to stress the fact that this is a model of the data. It's a mathematical model of the data. We're gonna call it F of X equal A1X plus A0. Now, what are the unknowns in this case? They are the A1 and A0. We don't know what the slope and intercept of that model curve is. 
Okay, but the X and Y values, they're data given to us, supplied by, uh, by the input data, okay? All right, now the question is, how can we fit a straight line to a nose into three or more um, data points? With interpolants, we could only fit a straight line into two points. Right here, we're gonna start with an example of three points, okay? So these three points are given to you in these um, uh, white dots over here, white disks over there. And my straight line fit is, gonna, is given by this blue curve, blue line, okay? So that's my Y model. And we don't know A1 and A0. Now for simplicity, I'm gonna call F the model evaluated at the input point I. So F of XI, that is the model, the, the Y value of the model evaluated at the input data point XI. So this could be XI could be 40, could be 41 or 43. So X0 is 40, for example, X1 is 41, X2 is 43. Now, y, the Y values are given to us, but the F values, those are the values evaluated by the model, okay? So we're gonna refer to the model as F sub I. Um, for simplicity, F of X, I, we're gonna call it F sub I just for simplicity. So that's the model evaluated at the Ith input data point. And then we could say that our model looks like this, F sub I is equal to A1 X sub I plus A0. And you can take whichever X I uh, you like from the input data. Here, we're just stuck with three data points, okay? Okay, and now as a representation on the graph, these red dots are the model values okay, evaluated at the X I. So F1 is the model curve evaluated at X1, which is 40. Okay, if you look at this curve over here, F1 is the value, F1 is the value evaluated at 40, F2 is the model value evaluated at 41, and F3 is the model value evaluated at 43. It is different from the input data because the input data is given, is fixed, is given to us by Y1, Y2, and Y3. And by definition of the regression, we know that those might be different. And the distance between the two is the error. So uh, the FIs, they denote the model values, the YIs, they denote the, the input values, the Y values of the, at the input, okay? So the idea now is, now that I have this model curve, I still don't know where that model curve uh, 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 is at because I don't know the slope and I don't know the intercept yet, but I'm gonna try to find the intercept and the slope by minimizing the total error Okay, between the FI and the YI values, as we just defined in, um, um, previously. Now, a common measure for the total error is just the Pythagorean norm of the individual, uh, the three errors. So in this case, we have three errors, right? The distance between F1 and Y1, the distance between F2 and Y2, and the distance between F3 and Y3. Those give us three errors, a vector of errors. And we learned this in iterative methods where you have a vector of errors, you can define an aggregate error. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna use a, um, a Pythagorean uh, a norm of the error committed at point. Oops, uh, okay, all right. Okay, now this, error, this aggregate error, is going to be the sum of the squares of the individual errors. Now you see here this S has Y1 minus F1 squared, that's the error, Y1 minus F1 is the error committed at point 1, correct? That's Y1 is the input data and F1 is the model curve. We're still trying to find F1, so but we're plugging it in because it's going to give us a formula to help us find what, what's going to go in F1. And Y2 minus F2 is the distance between F2 and Y2, right? So that's the error committed by the model curve at point two. And same thing for F3 and Y3. It is the error committed at point three between the model curve and the input data, okay? Now we know by definition that in this case, our model curve is a straight line given by A1X plus A0, or FI is A1XI plus A0. And we're trying to find A1 and A0. Again, I'm stressing that fact. So now I want you to go ahead and substitute, take a moment and substitute the um, FI into the formula above. Okay, just take a minute and write it down. Spell the whole thing out, okay, just to see what we get.
Okay, so I am back on Zoom. All right, give you a moment to uh, just plug in the uh, uh, equation, the FI. If you want to uh, look at a glance at your YouTube player, which I hope is muted right now, so we don't get feedback, you can see the slide and the question on it. Professor Saad? Yes, Carson. I had a, I had a quick question um, about, so why why is it common to use the Pythagorean norm instead of using just like like the absolute error or something like that, like finding the absolute value of uh, Y1 minus F1, so that, on? That's a great question. We're gonna hit on that a little bit later. There are other errors that you can define and they are absolutely reasonable measures. Um, however, um, they cause complications when we are trying to do the next step, which is the minimization process. If you take absolute values, you're going to get run into trouble when trying to do a minimization of the curve. And so that's why we prefer to take the squares because we want a positive error. Okay. And um, with that positive error, if you take the absolute value, it's going to be problematic when you're doing a minimization process, okay, which is going to happen next. But we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about other types of error. But yeah, great question. So I have a question in the chat from Marta. Is this what Excel does for us if we were to use Excel, plot the data and plot it? Yes, that is exactly it, Marta. And you ask it to plot the equation for you. All right, so let's see who is going to take this. Do I have a volunteer or should I run the wheel of uh, 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 fortune? <laughs> Okay, try. So, Vid, go ahead. Um, so, S equals y, y1 minus A1 X1 minus A0 square. Uh huh. Continue. And then, and then for the second one, it's going to be a Y2 a minus A1 X2 a minus mm -hmm. A1 square. Minus A1 X2 minus A0 square. A zero square, okay. And yeah. then for the third one, it's gonna be Y3 minus A, A1 X3 minus A naught square. Correct, that is correct. Okay, great, thank you, Sovit. Okay, so I'm gonna mute you and stop my video over here and then we'll switch back to, uh, to the other side of the internet uh, called YouTube. Okay, as Sophie Sovit shared with us um, in class um, on Zoom, uh, we simply are gonna plug in the FI values. Let's see if I can get the, my hand correctly. And we're gonna plug in the FI values into each one of those F1s and F3. Don't confuse the indexing, okay? Try to follow the, the red symbols uh, where you think about unknowns and what you know, okay? This is exactly what um, Sovid gave us. You simply plug in F1, which is A1, X1, okay, plus A0. You plug it in into the first term, and then the second term, and then the third term. And this is what you get. So this is a scalar value now, so a single number that represents a measure of the total error committed um, in, in the total error committed over here. So, you know, there's this, this error that we committed over here by plotting the, uh, putting a curve between those points, and that gives us error of that total error. It's just a measure of the error. Now, the idea is gonna change now. We said we're gonna find the curve that minimizes the error between the, uh, between the points and the model curve. Now, we're gonna be a little bit more specific. We're gonna say we're gonna find A0 and A1 that minimize this total error. 
So really, when we said find the curve that minimizes the error between the, the model curve and the data points, we're saying find the coefficients or the unknowns in that model curve, okay, that will minimize that error. Okay. And from what you've learned in um, calculus and in elementary mathematics, a function hits its, min its minimum or a maximum when its first derivative is zero. So for single valued functions, for multidimensional functions, like in this case, you should agree that we, I hope you agree that we have two dimensions here, two unknowns, which are the A0 and A0. Everything else is known, Y1 and X1 and XY2, X2, Y3, X3, they're given to you, right? They're supplied to you by the observed data. So the only two unknowns we have are A1 and A0. So this makes us a function, a true dimensional function of two, function of two independent variables, A0 and A1. And in this case, as is minimum, if the, its derivative with respect to each one of those unknowns is equal to zero. Now, if you conduct this operation, there's a theorem that shows that you're always going to get a minimum when you set um, these two to zero. So partial S with respect to A0 equal to zero and partial S with respect to A1 is equal to zero. So next step is to evaluate those and see what we get. And this is going to be your next activity. I want you to take the derivative of S, which is going on over here, and with respect to A0 and A1. Now, remember here, I remind you that U n prime, so if you're differentiating um, with respect to an unknown, an x, a few of x, U n prime is n U prime U n minus 1. Okay, so that gives you an idea of differentiation under the square. Okay, so go ahead. I'll see you on Zoom. Go ahead and work on this a little bit, and let's see what we get. All right, I am back on this side of the internet. If you wanna see that slide again, um, glance on your YouTube, it should show up in a few seconds. Uh, all right, should show up just now. Um, so my question to you was to take, to, to help me find the equations that govern the minimum of this, um, um, this error, this S function, okay? And to find that minimum, we need two equations because S was a function of two unknowns, A0 and A1. So you're going to go ahead and differentiate each and every term in that S, okay? And work it out by hand. It's a good exercise, okay? This is better than me writing it on the board for you. Because if I'm writing it on the board for you, it will be me writing it on the board for you, not you. I want you to write it on your notes, okay? You're differentiating with respect to A0 and A1. Okay, I'm going to mute myself now because so that I don't annoy you. Okay, I'm gonna mute myself now because so that I don't. Please uh, mute your YouTube. If you have any questions, feel free to just throw them at me right now while everyone else is working on their derivation.
Abby, you're right. I was looking for that word, the wheel of misfortune. I kept thinking, like, what am I going to call it? Something funny? <laughs> oh, God. All right. So give me the um, first one. So we're going to spin the Wheel of Misfortune twice. So give me the first one, Sammy. <laughs> yeah, so the partial derivative of S with respect to A0. Mm -hmm. I got negative 2 times quantity Y1 minus A1 X1 minus A0 mm -hmm. minus 2 times Y2 okay. minus A1 X2 minus A0. Yep. Yep. Minus 2 times Y3 minus yep. A1x3 yeah. minus A0. Can you explain a little bit how you treated each? I, I, I love how you used minus two quantity. So that quantity, can you explain to us how you conducted this derivative, this differentiation? So you had a quantity to the power two, right? So yeah. So with the, that's the chain or the power rule. I don't know. You pull the two down, mm -hmm. multiply two times that quantity, and mm -hmm. then you multiply by the derivative of the inside of that. Of those with respect, with which respect to a zero, one. which is negative one. Right. right. So, so your u, which is which I'm showing at the bottom of the slide, this u u to the power n prime. Your entire u mm -hmm. is this first quantity y one minus a one x one minus a naught squared. So, it's looking at the first term, and that entire quantity with this first differentiation, everything else is fixed. So, y one is fixed, a one is fixed, x one is fixed except a0, a0 is the variable. And so you just treat that as your x essentially, and you differentiate with respect to that. So you get n times n, which is two, times u prime, which is d, a, d minus a naught by d a naught, which is minus one. So you get the minus two times the quantity to the power one. All right, so let's do the second. The second one is gonna be a little bit more interesting because you have an x1. Okay, so I'm gonna spin the wheel of misfortune. Sarah, I haven't seen Sarah here today. Okay, looks like Sarah is not with us today, unfortunately. Um, all right, let's spin the wheel. Get Ellie. Ellie, are you with us today? Yeah, sorry, <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> yeah, all right, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so you I figured it was the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, the same idea as what Sammy was saying, except obviously we're di differentiating with respect to A1. Uh -huh. So when we differentiate the inside, we'd get like X1, or in the next one, we'd get X2. Yeah, minus yeah. X1 and minus X2. So you, minus, get, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you get minus 2 times X1, correct? Times the quantity mm -hmm. to the power 1, and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, we're going to switch back now to YouTube, to the other side of the internet. And I am going to mute myself, stop my video. All right, I'll see you on YouTube. All right, so just like we just discussed, um, the uh, differentiation, looks like you guys are all savvy with this differentiation stuff, so we're just gonna go ahead and cruise through it. So with respect to a naught, you just simply treat each term as a quantity, a function of, in this case, for the a naught, you treat everything as fixed, except for a naught, which is varying, varying, and you just do a standard differentiation. So with ds, with respect to a naught, you get this formula, and with ds, with respect to a1, you're going to carry an x1. Why? Because in, when you're differentiating with respect to a1, everything is fixed. Everything is essentially a constant except for a, a1. So when you differentiate with respect to a1, you're going to pick up minus x1, and you get the 2 from the power, and you get this formula. We're going to set these two equations equal to 0, right? Remember, remember where we started. We had xi and yi data. We're going to always refer to those as xi, yi. They're the input data. Then we put a model curve, and that model curve looked like a straight line, and it had two unknowns in it, a0 and a1. Then we defined an error, the average distance between that model curve and the input data, some measure of that distance. 
uh, an aggregate measure and we said we're going to minimize we're going to find a naught and a1 to minimize that error which is s over here and those are the equations for that again we are after a naught and a1 now if you are kind of seeing ahead what are we looking at over here uh, we're looking for a naught and a1 those are two unknowns and we need two equations and guess what we have those two equations, right? Those are two equations with two unknowns. Con contrast that to saying you're going to fit a straight line in th with three points. You're going to do an interpolant. It doesn't work because you have more equations than there are unknowns. But using the minimization strategy is very intelligent because it allowed you, it will allow you to get as many equations as there are unknowns. And as you will see as we move forward. All right. So now we're gonna, we're gonna take this up a notch and we're gonna do it for a general case. We just did it for three data points, right? X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X3, Y3. Now we're gonna do it for as many data points as you like. Here I'm giving the example of 10 data points. We're gonna do the derivation for N input data points, as many as you like. And again, we're gonna fit the model A0 plus A1X, okay? Question still is how can you fit a straight line, two unknowns into n data points? And the idea is the same. We're gonna minimize the error between our model curve and the input data, okay? And we're still gonna call fi as f evaluated at xi. So f1 is a1, x1 plus a0 and so on and so forth. Okay, now we define, the next step was to define the total error. And that total error is the Pythagorean norm of the individual errors committed at each input point. So I cannot stress this more than enough. Again, you have a model curve, and you have input data points. The distance between what the model curve is gonna give you versus what the input data was, that is an error. So for point one, you have y1 minus f1. For point two, you have y2 minus f2, and all the way to yn minus fn. Now we take the squares of those errors and sum them up. That gives you an average length, an average distance of the error. So that defines S, okay? Now, compact form, the nice thing about generalizing it is that you can write it in a nice, concise form. Now write S as the summation going over all points. So I don't have an index over here because it's just summation over all the points that you have. Sum of yi minus fi squared, agreed? Now, fi is still a1 xi plus a0. So nothing's changed there. And simply, if you substitute now fi into this formula, you're going to get yi minus a1 xi minus a0 squared, all summation. See how concise this formula is? You can apply this to the three data points which we had earlier, and you're going to get y1 minus a1 x1 minus a0 squared plus y2 minus a1 x2 minus a0 squared, and so on for the third point. Okay, it's just a more concise form. Now, I'm gonna ask you to do the minimization process again. Find A0 and A1, the unknowns in the curve, or find the curve, that's the equivalent of saying we're gonna find that curve, that straight line, that minimizes the total error. And this is the total error. And S is minimum if, so S, step back for a second, S is a function of A1 and A0. Those are two unknowns, so it's a multidimensional function. And S is minimum if its derivatives with respect to each one of those unknowns is equal to zero. So the S by the A0 equals zero, the S by the A1 equals to zero. Same thing. Now I want you to do the derivation using this summation form, not for individual terms, right? Like we did before, it was more tedious. This is actually simpler because you're going to do it for any point I. Okay, I'll see you on Zoom. Okay, I am back on Zoom. Take a minute and evaluate this, uh, these derivatives. And I claim that this time it's easier because in the previous example, you had three of the same of the quantity, three of the same looking quantity, right? And you had to differentiate each one of those. But this is just one representative of that quantity, a template of that quantity, if, if, if you like. And the differentiation is going to be much easier.
Looks like some of you are still working. Do you need a few more seconds? No? All right. Should we spin the wheel of misfortune? Abby is smiling. Oh, Marta. Marta, do you have an answer for DS by DA naught? Oh. Um, I think so. <laughs> can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. We can all hear you. Go ahead. Um, I have the I have negative two in the front and then the sum uh -huh. of Y I minus um A one X I minus mm -hmm. a zero correct and i think it's the same for the other one but do you swap um a1 and X and a0 or is it the same uh what do you mean i i swap for the second one um do you change yeah do you change no, the second anything one for the second one the second one you got it you didn't get it right okay so let's um let's ah, okay. uh, give someone else some misfortune but you got the first one correct the second one you you missed the coefficient Okay, let's, so let's pick someone else. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, James, we already we already heard from you, so we gotta spend someone else. Okay, so I got Megan, Megan, and if I picked you earlier, please let me know. I got for the second one negative two x i parentheses y i minus a one x i minus a. -Z. Yeah, very good. Thank you so much. So you got it right. Okay, so I'll switch back to the YouTube stream and we'll show the answer, but you can tell that this is a much easier and more compact form than what we did with all the individual terms. All right, so I'll see you on the YouTube stream. Okay, so now that we derived the equations for the general case, at least for a straight line, okay, um, you can see that these are the formulas for uh, the differentiation. They're more compact because we have this summation form, right? And so with respect to A0, the derivative is you simply fix yi and a1xi and, and differentiate with respect to A0 which is gonna give you a negative sign and then multiplied by the two, that's gonna give you this minus two. Summation, everything else remains the same. You don't have a power anymore over there, okay? Now for the differentiation with respect to A1, um, you have to pay attention to the coefficient multiplying A1. Okay, so you have yi minus A1 xi. So the derivative with respect to A1 is gonna be a minus xi, okay? So be careful of that. And then you pick up the, the two, from the power uh, over there, the power, and you get these compact formulas. Now, these are still two equations with two unknowns, which is great, right? That's what we expected, um, okay? And then we can solve those using th something that we know. Guess what? It's gonna be linear systems, right? So those are just two equations with two unknowns, okay? So now we're gonna formalize how that looks like. I'm gonna split the summation for simplicity and I'm gonna get rid of the negative two because there's a zero on the other side. So I can eliminate the negative two to simplify it. And then I'm gonna split the summation. I'm gonna take some yi and then um, uh, minus um, a1 sum xi minus a naught, minus sum a naught, sorry. And then um, sum xi yi for the second term and minus a1 sum xi squared and minus a naught sum xi. Okay, so you agree that these are the two forms. And then I'm gonna extract all the red terms. Those are the unknown coefficients. Don't be confused by the summations. All the summations, they are known quantities, right? So because the x1 and y1, they're given to us. And any summation that includes x1, y1, x2, y2, et cetera, and so on, they are just single numbers, right? So everything over here is known except for the red symbols in red. Now I want you to pay attention to this last term, a naught times n, with the total number of points, that's simply the summation of A naught. So if it's like saying summation of uh, A naught, summation of one going from um, one to N, uh, zero to N. 
um, that's uh, sorry one to n that's n points okay so that's what you get the a naught times n that's where you get that from that's the only little caveat over there okay so now I want you to take this these are two equations with two unknowns and I want you to just take this and write it in matrix form you got one minute I'll see you on zoom I'm back. <laughs> All right, so go ahead and write these two equations with two unknowns as a matri in matrix form, okay? So I want a coefficient matrix, a vector of unknowns equals to a right-hand side. That's why we study linear systems first thing in the semester, because we've seen linear systems, with uh, interpolation, we're already we're starting to see linear systems with uh, regression. We're going to keep seeing linear systems. Okay, I got a question from Porter. Um, can you explain why the a naught is in a summation in the for, in the first equation? I'll explain this in a second when we go back to the slides. But basically, because you're summing a naught n times, so if you had to split, think of the s. Think of s when we had three points. You had a zero in the first term, a zero in the second term, and a zero in the third term, right? So that's three a zeros. If you had four points, you'd have four A zeros. If you had 50 points, you'd have 50 A zeros. That's why you put this A naught in the summation. It's a, it's a caveat that you might miss with this summation form, but if you are doing it individually on each term, um, that's why you get this multiple A zero. I hope this answers your question, Porter. If you, if you guys have questions, I might miss them on the chat. Um, so please, um, uh, uh, sp speak out if I miss um, your question. I'll try to check on the chat. Okay. All right. Time. Let me spin the wheel of misfortune. Okay. What do we got? Salman Ahmed. Okay. Salman, are you with us? Okay. Let's try someone else. Uh, Sammy already picked you. Let's try someone else. Brayden. I'm here. Sorry, I was just trying to unmute myself. Yeah. Hey, Brayden. So I guess I'm just a little bit confused. Uh, you're wanting us to pull out. So I believe that for the second part, it should be A1 and A0 for our vertical columns. But then for the first part, it looks like there should be three unknowns in our matrix, which our B value should be a two by one, correct? Because we have two rows for the two equations with the one unknown. But the way I can see this problem, I could see a three by one or yeah, three by two multiplied by a two by one, giving okay. us an answer, a B value of a three by one. So I'm just confused no, on that. That's, that's incorrect. So that, that system is unsolvable and that's not a representation of this system. So let me ask you to do the following. What if you remove in the first equation, what if you move some yi to the right-hand side? And in the second equation, what if you, you move some xi yi to the right-hand side? Now, can you write it in matrix form? I believe so. If we okay, if we pull those out as constants, they uh, are, then aren't they, aren't they constants? Yeah, they are. Then I guess that was where I was mistaken or mislooking. So then it would be for the top equation, it would be the sum of y i times uh, the sum of x i minus n 
Uh, and then so the second part would be. So the first, the first row of the matrix you said was what? The first row is minus sum. It's X. going to be right minus the sum of x i minus n mm -hmm. multiplied by the a one a zero a one a naught equals zero. Mm -hmm. And then for the second no, part, equal, it's going equal, to be equal equal minus sum i sum y i. Oh, you're moving the constants minus. Okay, minus some y i, and then for yeah. the second part, it's going to be the uh, minus the sum of x one squared x i minus the or x i x i squared mm -hmm. minus x the sum of x i times a one a naught, mm -hmm. and then it's going to equal negative sum of x i y i. That's correct. Okay, so a, a Braden raised an, an interesting point that might be confusing to some of you is when you are presented with a system of equations like this, you have zero on the right hand side, you have unknowns multiplied by coefficients, constant coefficients. So in this case, some xi is a constant coefficient multiplying the unknown a1, n is a constant coefficient multiplying the unknown a0, but you also have a constant on the left hand side. That is going to confuse you when you build your matrix, right? So because your matrix is coefficient times unknowns equal to a bunch of constants, right? So what you do, you always move the constants to the right-hand side because those are just going to be lumped together as one single constant. So it's going to, you're going to have to move the sum yi to the right-hand side and sum xi yi to the right-hand side in the second equation. You can see this in a second, okay? I'm uh, going to switch to the stream right now. See you on YouTube. All right, so as we just discussed, um, the first step in dealing, converting this system into a matrix form is to separate the unknowns with their coefficients on the left-hand side over here and put everything that is known as a constant, well, not that, the, everything that's known that's not multiplied by any of the unknowns, so some yi and some xiyi, put it on the right-hand side. And notice I multiplied everything by a negative sign because when you move to the right-hand side, the sum yi is going to become minus sum yi and minus sum xi yi, and you multiply it for sign. So you get this nice kind of structure. And then you take this and simply put this in matrix form. Now, I like to order my unknowns starting from 0 to um, a 1, etc. cetera. Um, the way Braden discussed it with us, we had that inverted. That is still completely legitimate. It doesn't matter, but I like to do it this way because it's incremental in that sense. And then again, a matrix representation is nothing more than a system of equations. So the first equation here is n times a naught, correct? Plus some xi times a1, which is this term, equal to some yi, which is that term. Same thing for the second equation. It's simply the dot product of this row vector by the column vector equal to some xi yi. And that's a system of linear equations. It's amazing how we get linear equations uh, anywhere we go. And that's why we studied them early on in the semester, because we're going to see them everywhere. And for this particular case, you can very easily solve this system of equations by hand, and you're going to get this solution. It's a little bit you know, cumbersome. There's a lot of algebra clear. We want to do this in a probably in a programming or a do it in a programming calculator, um, uh, but this is the solution. And when you apply this formula, the way if I were doing it by hand, again, if I'm on an airplane and I'm doing a regression fit, I don't have a calculator, I don't have my Python, I'm doing it on the back of the envelope, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually not memorize this formula. I will derive it from scratch. And then what I would do is for each term, I would create you know, a table and then fill in the values and get the... Um, the final values and plug them into the, so the solution over here and get the slope and the intercept, sorry, the slope A1 and the intercept A0 and apply it to whatever data I have. In this case, we get these numbers A1, 1.0043, etc. and A0, 123, just like 
what um, Excel would have given you, but we did this by hand. And that's how you do a straight line regression, okay? Now, that formula that I said you can plug in into a calculator and whatnot, uh, in, in practice, we're not gonna use that. In practice, what we're gonna do, we're always gonna program the system of equations that's gonna be more uh, generalizable. So instead of programming just the, that little formula, we're gonna program um, the entire system of equations and that will make it easier for us as we move forward and do polynomial and more complex um, regression. So um, this is, I'm gonna explain to you a little bit now how we're gonna do this and then we're gonna switch to a coding session and we'll start try to get to code this before we finish class today. So what we've got here, if you have xi and yi, those are your input data. If you have them as NumPy arrays, then you can build the regression matrix with the following information. Um, you need n, first term, and that's simply that you use len of xi, that gives you the size of xi, so that's the length of the data. You don't wanna count the data by hand, right? So you just bring in the data, you might read it from a text file, might be given to you by an instrument, so all you do to get n is len of xi. Then sum xi, um, is simply numpy.sum of xi, okay? So that's how you do it, you call numpy.sum. Sum of xi squared is simply numpy.sum numpy of xi squared. So it's gonna take each xi and make it square. Okay, so I have a typo over here. This should be, um, oh, and no typo, sorry. This should be sum xi squared. This is the sum xi. Sum yi is the same thing, numpy.sum of yi. And finally, sum of xi yi is numpy.sum xi times yi. It really cannot get any easier than this. This is a working example that we're gonna do together now in, in a Jupyter notebook. Now, this would allow you to solve for the A0 and A1. Those are the, um, so once you program the matrix, we're gonna do this together in a second. Once you program the matrix, you do a linear solve in Python. We're not gonna use uh, any of the algorithms we, we learned about because those systems are small. These systems we're dealing with are right over here. They're small. So we're just gonna use the built-in Python solve and that is gonna return to you the unknowns, A0 and A1 in this case. And then once you have A0 and A1, you have to build a routine, a Python routine, a Python function that, that takes any value X and makes it A1 times X plus A0. And I show you also the code for this one. So that's what we're gonna do together next. Um, we're gonna switch back to Zoom. We're gonna share the screen with you, but I want you to go ahead and download the following no notebook, regression activity one height femur dot ipython notebook. Okay, I will see you on the coding activity in Zoom. Uh, professor, for me at least, it's saying that the activity is an part of an unpublished module again. Hello. Okay. Hey, thanks for letting yes. me know. Yes, one second. One second. The many mistakes um, that one uh, will commit. <laughs> okay. So let me log into Canvas and publish that one. Hopefully, we'll have enough time. We have 15 minutes, should be enough to get done with this canvas is funny when i wanted to unpublish something it publishes it and when i wanted to publish it uh, it doesn't publish it all right so we go into jupyter notebooks uh, regression activities nope it should be published if you go on modules uh, Okay, sorry, the module wasn't published, but the regression document was still in the file, um, in the file uh, directory. Anyway, go ahead and download, um, download that, okay? And I'm gonna adjust uh, my screen a little bit over here. Hey, Professor, I had a quick question. Mm -hmm. There is a little bit of extrapolating with this, but I'm just curious, 
Uh, the way that we have our equation right now, if we were to say that somebody doesn't have a femur, if their femur is zero inches, we would say that their rough height would be like 123 centimeters, which obviously that doesn't make sense. If they don't have a femur, That's, they don't have any height. Is yeah, there so, a way so, that we can set bounds or? Not, not with regression. That's an un unrealistic condition you're putting on that system. On this derivation so regression is supposed to still kind of work within the bounds but it does extrapolate it does move away from it um, but for a person who's got zero femur like you said it, it, the date then it doesn't make sense that's an unphysical result right so you could program a you could say you know if x equals zero then throw an error or something um, but yeah, that becomes an unrealistic. It's a good point that you raise um, for sure. Um, it's a good point, but um, it's kind of un unrealistic. Like the zero femur is a person that doesn't exist. So they clearly do not have a height and the purpose of the regression um, doesn't, is not gonna help you with that. It's more of a philosophical <laughs> perspective on this. All right, so are you, do you all have the workbook? Load it up. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of have almost everything put in for you over here. So these are some of the magic boilerplate that I put in um, the matplotlib inline and the SVG. You just simply, excuse me, go ahead and execute that. Now we're taking the data from the height versus femur into xi and yi arrays and i took the liberty of putting those in for you this those are the data exactly put in the slides so 40 41 43 43 44 40 etc and the first thing you do again is just plot the data so go ahead and execute that plot and this is what you're going to get a um, height versus femur plot with these scatter dots that's why it's nice to do scatter so if you were to do to remove the symbol um, it would give you this sort of thing, right? So if you, um, oh, I have not shared my screen. I'm sorry, sorry about that. You're probably um, not <laughs> seeing what I'm doing. Okay, so what I was saying is, um, if you go ahead, so with the plot, if you execute the plot, this is what you're gonna get. And that's what I, what I always recommend for you to do is to simply um, plot a scatter, do a scatter plot with symbols. If you were to remove the symbol over here, you're gonna get something like this, which is completely ridiculous, okay? So stick with the scatter with symbols. Now we're gonna regress to a straight line. And what I'm showing you here are the formulas, is the formula, the matrix regression matrix and some Xi, some Xi, et cetera, um, over here. And I want you now to take a moment to fill in the blanks over here. I want you to build this coefficient matrix using what we discussed um, on the slides. Okay, so num n is len, uh, len xi, and then you can do summations um, by using np.sum of xi, that gives you, you know, sum of xi, and same thing, np.sum xi squared is gonna give you um, the summation of um, xi squared, et cetera, and so on and so forth. Okay, so go ahead and fill in the blanks here, please. And let's see what you get. <clears throat> if you have an answer, just uh, pitch in. I do have the answer on the slides, okay? So uh, you don't have to come back to these lectures all the time, but I want you to just try to fill in the blanks. Again, we're filling, we're trying to solve the system in this form and the matrix is N, some XI, some XI, some XI squared. Okay, so let me see, do we have any takers? Okay, wheel of misfortune it is. You're forcing my hand. All right, okay, Kia, are you with us? Did I butcher yes, I am. Name? Did I butcher your name? 
It's Kaya, but it's all right. Kaya, I apologize. I, I have a French background, and so I, the I is always E in French, so <laughs> I apologize. So Kaya, yeah. No worries. <laughs> um, so you're just asking what to put in for A? Uh-huh. Okay, so I put in, um, inside the array, I did N, mm -hmm. comma, mm -hmm. NP dot sum of XI. Correct. And then on the lower one, I did NP dot sum of XI. Correct. And then the next one is NP dot sum of XI, two stars, and then two. So absolutely, to the power of two. Absolutely fantastic. That's correct. Now I have an invalid syntax because I have a couple things here. Okay. So exactly. And as you would expect, thank you, Kaya. This is great. So as you would expect, these are constants, right? Because they're data given to you, some xi and some xi squared. They're just constants. Okay. So that's why you get when you print A, the array, you get 10, 4444, and nine, you know, one nineteen thousand eight hundred and six. There's just numbers. All right. So now who's gonna help me with the right hand side? Some yi and some xi yi. Wheel of Misfortune. Uh, Sydney, are you with us? One second, I had to unmute myself. Um, oh yeah, Sydney. Yeah. Right, right? <laughs> Do we okay. have the YI? Yes, so, oh, yeah. so we the, decided um, yes. Yes. Yeah. So for the B array. The, that's um, mm -hmm. YI for the first Correct. value. For the second one should be some x i y i n p dot sum x i times y i yeah <laughs> correct absolutely fantastic all right and then you print the array and it's again constants as we expected because all of those data were given to us okay so the only unknowns are the a naught and a one now once you have the coefficient matrix and the right hand side you have enough information to solve the system of equations for the unknowns. Our unknowns here are what? A0 and A1, and they're gonna be returned to us in that order. So now we're gonna use the numpy in algebra.solve. We saw, we used this before. Um, take a moment to think about what we wanna put in over here to get the solution. All right, wheel of misfortune. Here we go. I can volunteer if you don't have okay. a volunteer. Okay, Ma Marta, did we pick you earlier? We picked you earlier. So yeah. No, I don't want to. I, I want to be fair. Okay. <laughs> I want to be very fair to okay. everyone else. <laughs> and Kaya, we also picked you. So let's pick someone else. Uh, Maxwell. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you have um, a... So I just put A and B. Great, yeah. Lin algebra solve. Exactly, because Lin algebra solve takes a coefficient matrix in the first argument and the right hand side in the next argument. Okay, now we did the solution, we put it in the variable sol, and then we print them. So, Maxwell, what are these two numbers? What do they correspond to? Um, I think it would be AO and then A1. A0 Correct. and A1. Correct. Yep. We solved those in that order, A0 and A1. So the solution contains them in that order, A0 and A1. Now, suppose for a moment we were to do what Braden suggested. Remember, Braden has suggested we this, this is flipped. The first row was some xi, some xi squared, and the second row was n and some xi, and the right-hand side was also inverted then what would the solution look like? It would be one and 123. It would be also inverted because Braden's approach was to solve them in the opposite, in the other, uh, in reverse order. So if we follow Braden's approach, we would put, we would exchange these, we would, we would have exchanged these rows, okay? So this would be the first row and this would be the second row, okay? I'm just going to prove to you that we get the same answer. And same thing with B. If you remember Braden's question, Braden's answer 
he had everything um, inverted because his solution consisted of doing a one and then um, and then a a naught. Sorry, so issue here. And then if we do now this guy solve mp dot lin algebra dot solve, then oh we got the same thing. Hold on, we got some x i squared and and some x i y i. Okay, so hmm. I think. You just switch the rows, return. but you have to switch the columns. Um, I switched. No, he had some xi, some xi squared. Need to just switch. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You are correct. We switched. We should have switched the rows. This is uh, Sammy. That was Sammy, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You are, you are correct. I think you are correct. So we'd have to switch this guy. This is mislead a misleading way, unfortunately, using um, these lists. Algebra dot solve a comma b. Nope, that's still not correct. Anyway, um, forget this for a moment. I think lin algebra dot solve is returning these in a certain order. Um, I will look into this and I will get back with you next time. But for the time being, know that these are solved in this order. Okay, that. This is going to be a naught, and this is going to be a one. Um, I think there might be either a bug or something I'm misinterpreting with lin algebra dot solve and how it's returning the order. Now we have one last step with two minutes. We're going to do this in two minutes. Now we have the coefficients. We claim that a zero is a naught is the first entry in solution, and a one is the second entry. Now solution is just an array. Okay, it's just an array. So let's make sure it contains the correct values. Okay, the solution is just an array. And to access the first entry, we simply index into that array. So A0 is solution zero, the entry zero in solution, and A1 is the entry one in uh, solution. So this is how we get A0, A1 now. We're gonna use those to develop our model curve, which is A0, A0 plus A1x. So go ahead and spend a minute to create a Y model function that I can call to do regression. Okay, to do a prediction. Okay, so go ahead and do that. What is gonna go in here? Let me see, Let me spin the wheel. We got Sarah again. I about it. Okay. Uh, Rob, are you with us? So who, who, who said they got it? Uh, me. Alan, go ahead. Yeah, so it's a... Uh... I just built like the little space bar, below, not space, enter below the what the y model thing, put y equals a1 times x plus a naught. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So a1 times x, exactly. Now when we execute this, now we can simply do a prediction. Y model, the regression, the regressed curve at femur length of 42, you get 165 centimeters, okay? At length 40, you get 163. Now notice that's not gonna be the same value in the input data because the input data gave you at 40, it gave you exactly 163, okay? So that's gonna be something entirely different, all right? Because it's regression, it's finding a trend in the data that minimizes the error, okay? Um, finally, what you could do is now plot your Y model at the input values and compare that to the scatter data that was input. Um, to you and you simply do this like this. So you take the XI and you evaluate the model curve at XI and you get that straight line, okay? That blue line and the red dots are your data. And this is how you do um, a regression to a straight line, okay? Um, that's what Excel was producing to you. Marta asked that question. I think Braden asked that, made that comment um, a couple lectures ago. But this is what goes behind it. This is the mathematics and the intuitive understanding that goes behind it. All right, thanks so much for your attention. I'm gonna hang out here for a few minutes and uh, then I have a meeting.